uh, the new year, uh, 2022. I've seen some jokes that saying it's, you know, make it sure it's 2022 and not T-O-O, but um, um, that's something that hopefully we can all agree on. But New Year's is really an interesting culture, I mean, a holiday for our culture, if you think about it. Because if we're honest about our culture, we're really, we're full of uh, cynics, uh, people who see the negative in pretty much everything. But nonetheless, uh, people still feel confident that with the new year uh, comes some new concept of self. You know, new year, new me. And what this does, this hope of transformation produces a sense of optimism that's pretty widespread in our culture amongst a lot of different people. But as we all really and truly know, this optimism isn't that well grounded. Uh, We don't know what this next year holds, and ultimately whatever personalized law or resolutions that we set up for ourselves, we fail to obtain. Heck, we even make jokes about it. Uh, Typically, we joke that in February, those are all kind of forgotten about, and we don't want to bring it up until the next new year. And the reality is, is that the sense of optimism that many experience during this time ultimately proves to be a fantasy that people escape to for a moment before returning to the brokenness and the pain of the reality of their lives. Happy New Year. (laughs) Now, generally, optimism is a good thing. It's good. And not only is it good, but I believe that optimism is able to be well-founded so that we can be confident in our optimism. Now, we're kind of in a a transition week. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 11 coming out of our Christmas series and going into an upcoming series on um, the gospel and evangelism, which Randy's going to talk about in a moment. But we're going to be looking at Hebrews 11, 20 through 22 today. And in that passage, we we see three guys who uh, display this confident optimism in their lives. It's Isaac. Jacob and Joseph. And this optimism that they have, it arises from their forward-looking faith, the supernatural faith that God gives to his people that looks not only to what God has done, but what God is doing and will do in the future. And what I believe that the Spirit is teaching us today from this passage is that forward-looking faith is optimistic about the future in spite of the pain of the present. So read with me in this this passage. It says, By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Hebrews 11, 20-22. Let's pray. Father, we confess with confidence that you are a good Father. Through the work of your Son applied to our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we rejoice in our status as your children and the fact that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Oh, Father, thank you. Holy Spirit, help us this morning to understand the Scripture. Help me to preach Christ and his word and power. And I pray that you would prepare our hearts, all of ours, to, to hear and obey your voice as you're speaking to us through your scriptures. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins, that we might share in the hope that we have through your resurrection. And, O oh, triune God, we pray that you would bless the reading and teaching of your word this morning, for it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray by his Spirit. Amen. So when you're thinking about these three guys and what we see in Hebrews 11, I want you to consider for a moment what's going on in their lives. So Isaac is blessing his sons in the midst of deception, personal failing, plots of murder, family strife, and the sending away or fleeing of Jacob, all while being a stranger in the land that had been promised to him. Jacob and Joseph aren't even in the promised land, but they're in the land of Egypt knowing that they would not return to the promised land in this life. And on top of that, all three of these guys are 
aging and about to die. Yet each of these men display a healthy, optimistic faith in spite of their less than ideal circumstances. Now this optimism did not arise because they were naive or because they were callous to the events that were going on around them. No, but it arises from their faith in the goodness and promises of God. If you look, the, the, three, uh, the two blessings of Isaac and Jacob and then Joseph's instructions are going to be on the screen. But this is what Isaac says. He says, God Almighty bless you, talking to Jacob, and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Now Jacob to Joseph's two sons, with Joseph standing there, the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on, in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now Joseph, what he says to his brothers at the end of his life, he says, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land, that's Egypt, to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So what we see in these three passages is that at the root of their optimism is a faith in the fact that God has promised to establish and bless his people through the offspring of Abraham, and that God has promised to deliver them from the hands of their enemies. Now, ultimately, when we, when we think about the Scripture in the Old Testament and, and from our position post-Christ and His resurrection and Pentecost, their optimism is based on the types and shadows of the greater that is to come that we know clearly in Christ Jesus. And the optimism that they have and the optimism that we're called to have is ultimately built upon the same foundation, and that is Jesus Christ and His gospel. Because Jesus is the son of promise. He is the son of Abraham, the son of David, who bore sin's curse of death in our place. And he is the one who is leading his people in a triumphant procession, in a second exodus from this world into his new creation. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Because of this, and of this alone, we are optimistic about the future. Our faith is an optimistic faith. Now, as I said, this does not negate the pain, the suffering, the hurt that we embrace and deal, and deal with in the present. All things that we experience in this life are not good. But because of what Christ has done, is doing, and will do, all things do work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. We are not naive people. We're not calloused to the brokenness of sin that we endure in this life. But we are optimistic because we have been redeemed from our evil. All of it. All the junk that you want to forget about last year, all the junk that you've already committed in this year, if you are in Christ, you are redeemed. You are a son of God by adoption. You are forgiven. And we know that the resurrection of Christ, that we celebrate in Easter, and we celebrate every Sunday as we, as we commemorate the resurrection on the Lord's Day, is only the first fruits of a greater harvest that is to come because God will surely visit us again. And rather than having to have someone lug our bones to the promised land, by the word of God and the shout of the angel, our bodies will be raised up, clothed with glorified flesh, and we will march with Christ into his promised land as he as we witness him defeat every one of his foes by the breath of the word of his mouth. Because of Christ and because of the gospel message that we 
know and believe or in the gospel message that's put out there for you today to know and believe we can have a faith that is forward looking and optimistic about the future in spite of the pain of the present so how does this faith this optimistic faith express itself in our daily living that's testified in this passage. There's many ways that this does this. But from these three, three guys, how does this optimistic faith express itself? Well, first, optimistic faith prepares us to die well. One of the things that ties these three men together is the fact that each of them were old and nearing death at the timing of the events that we see mentioned in Hebrews 11. Each of these men died well. Now, they did not do it perfectly. If you read the narratives of their deaths and different things, there there are errors that each of them deal with. But their optimistic faith did prepare their hearts so that they could face death triumphantly. They died well. They died by faith. And my hope for myself and for each of you is not that only we would live well, but that we would also die well that when that day comes, that we would be found testifying of God's goodness, resting in his purposes, and worshiping his name throughout our lives and even in our dying. Now, I want to explain just for a moment what happens when we die, what the scripture testifies. Because I believe that it's important to reflect on that fact in light of the gospel promises. And ironically, I believe it's one of the ways that we prepare our hearts to die well, and it's one of the ways that we express our optimism about the future. Because the reality is, unless the Lord returns first, and that caveat applies for everything else from here when I'm talking about dying. Unless the Lord returns first, death is coming for us all. Now let that settle in. You and I will die one day. And death is not a blessing. It's the curse of sin. But death is an enemy that has been dealt the fatal blow at the cross in the resurrection. And it's an enemy that will be finally destroyed once and for all at the return of Christ when it is cast into the lake of fire with Satan himself. And because of what Christ has done on behalf of his people His disciples overcome the sting of death and are aided by the Spirit in a unique way during their last moment. So what happens? What happens when we die? There's a lot of stuff out in the culture that, you know, speaks to it. Let's go to the Word of God. Luke 17, which is the parable of um, the rich man and Lazarus. I'm not actually going to read it, so just keep them in your mind. Luke 17, parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Luke 23, with Jesus and the thief on the cross, and as well as 2 Corinthians 5, uh, and the first opening of that chapter, as Paul's talking about, these three passages, and I'm sure there are more, but they indicate that when we take our last breath, our spirits are immediately ushered into the presence of God and into the presence of the resurrected and exalted Christ. That's what happens when we die. Now, in a real sense, we are with the Lord. And in another real sense, we are in the ground. Because our bodies are in the ground, but our spirits are in the Lord. Because we're in an intermediate and disembodied state for a time. It's going to be better than anything that we know in this world. But it will not be as good as the resurrection life that is coming that I've already mentioned. Because the resurrection life is better than what we will know in the intermediate state. When our spirits are with the Lord and our body is in the ground. Because one day as I've already said, that the Lord will descend and our spirits will be reunited to our risen and glorified bodies. And it's in these perfect bodies that we will forever dwell in the joy of our Master and His presence in the presence of our God in the new creation. A physical creation that is totally and perfectly restored. This is the hope that we have in Christ. That death is a defeated enemy. When we die, our spirits go into the presence of our Lord with the hope that one day our spirits will be reunited with our bodies, but in a glorified, perfect manner that will never know any sting or shadow of sin. Now, death is the chief fear of our culture. 
if you think about it in a culture that values autonomy and personal liberty and and the the ability that i can do whatever i want to do whenever i want to do it death makes sense that it would be a terror to our culture because ultimately death is a certainty and if you're not in christ instead of being ushered into the presence of lord when you die your spirit is ushered into the into hades into a place of spiritual torment and you too will be resurrected but not unto eternal life but you along with Satan, death, his demons will be cast into an eternal lake of fire that will be horrific words cannot express the reality of hell but death is a defeated enemy Christ died for our sins and he overcame death and his life his abundant and eternal life is offered to each of you this morning so that if you repent of your sins you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord you will be saved and you will know the joy of a life with Christ And you'll be able to live with an optimistic faith that reflects on death for what it is, a defeated enemy, and that prepares your heart to, to die well, and in doing that, prepare those around you to grieve well when you when you pass. To grieve as those who have hope. So a specific application for this week of how you can apply this is I want you to think about the fact that you're going to die unless the Lord returns. And I want you to think about that in light of the gospel. Consider it for a moment and ask the Spirit to prepare your heart and to prepare you and those around you for the day when it comes. Because we have a fixed number of days in this life. We're not promised tomorrow. You may die at 90, you may die at 19. Or any day in between. We do not know. So ask the Lord to prepare you for when that day comes. And because of what Jesus has done, disciples of Christ can proclaim with confidence, along with King David, that in peace, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you, O Lord, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. That's Psalm 4, 8. So optimistic faith prepares us to die well. And it also blesses others with the truths of God's goodness and his gospel. So another thing that ties these three men together is that they're each involved in some manner of the blessing of their children and grandchildren. Isaac and Jacob are actively blessing others, and then with Jacob blessing Joseph's sons, Joseph is there bringing his sons to be blessed. Now blessing others, the practice that we see in this, may seem foreign to us today. It may not, but it may seem foreign to us today. But there are many examples in Scripture of individuals blessing God's people generally and other individuals specifically, according to God's character and revealed promises. One of the most popular ones are of individuals, you see Jacob blessing his sons. Generally, in God's people, you see number six, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, that you may have peace. Now, in this passage, we do see Isaac blessing Esau, who is outside of God's people, and that provides grounds for common grace blessings and God's goodness. But I want to focus more on how we can uniquely bless those who are a part of God's people. And in doing that, I want us to look at what John Piper says about this practice, because I think he understands it well and communicates it effectively. So I'm going to quote him at length here. When we bless others, he says, we are directly speaking to another person or group of people. So we're speaking to someone else. But we're asking the Lord to do the blessing. When we bless someone, we're making plain that we believe God is the decisive actor, but that he uses human means to perform his act of blessing. Because if we don't believe that, we wouldn't be speaking the blessing. Our speaking, we believe, is part of God's way of doing the blessing. This is what's unique and powerful and precious about a blessing. In the very act of blessing others, we become part of the means by which God blesses the person. 
that we're speaking to. So Piper, when he concludes, he says, the relationship that such a blessing forges is part of the blessing that God imparts. Now, I want to say just very quickly that some people in our culture today and in the church, in the, they bear the name of the church, abuse this practice, and they lead others astray, blessing others with things that God did not promise for this life and, and instilling in them a, a naive hope. That's not what I'm talking about. Because remember, the power in the blessing is not in the words that we say. It's not in saying in Jesus' name, like that's a magical incantation that we can do. But it's in God and His character and His purposes. And a blessing that departs from the righteous character of God and His purposes is not a blessing. It's a curse. So, with that in mind, let's think about this practice of blessing others with prayers of blessing. Because when handled properly, in the act of blessing, what we do in that is that we remind the others, we remind others and ourselves of God's character and promises, and we're used by God as his instrument to strengthen and establish others in the truth of God. And this happens both in the words and the love that is shared in the relationship. And this practice strengthens both the vertical relationship between God and his people and the horizontal relationships among God's people. So how does this practice express optimism? Now remember, think about what these guys are going through. Isaac is blessing Jacob in perhaps the worst moment of his life. If, if not, it may be the second. Him waking up behind, beside someone else might be a, the worst moment in his life. But this is definitely up there. Jacob is blessing his grandsons after being driven from the promised land by famine to the wicked land of Egypt. Yet they invoke future blessings on their children and their grandchildren. Because blessing others, how it expresses optimistic faith, what it does is it sees past, it sees past the immediate experience of brokenness and pain to the restoring work of God that's happening behind the scenes. And it communicates that to that person. Now, as I've mentioned, these blessings can be general blessings for the people of God. Uh, we see this in the New Testament with Paul's blessings to uh, the church in Thessalonica. He does that on a few occasions, one of them being, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's doing there is he's blessing the church at Thessalonica with a gospel reality. Now may the Lord God sanctify you completely. God has promised to sanctify them by the gospel. He's blessing the church by communicating the gospel promises to them in this form of a blessing. So these blessings generally for God's people are great opportunities to bless our brothers and sisters with realities of the gospel such as the peace, comfort, and righteousness of Christ that belongs to us that we sometimes lose sight of in the midst of this life. And we also see that there are specific blessings. And these have the opportunity to be very meaningful in the lives of others. Because in these blessings, what we're doing is we're identifying through the lens of Scripture the way that we see God working in others' lives in unique ways. And we bless that person with the same gospel truths, but applied uniquely to their person as God has uniquely created them and uniquely gifted them in Christ Jesus. And we see that very clearly in uh, some of the Old Testament blessings of, their of the children and grandchildren. So this passage does testify of the power it can have when parents and grandparents, specifically, bless their children and grandchildren. We should be praying blessings over our, our, our kids and grandkids that are rooted in the character of God and what he has promised to do. But it's no, by no means limited to a household. You have opportunity to encourage any brother or sister who is part of the family of God and who, are you, and who you are close to by blessing them uniquely according to God's righteousness and according to his promises. So one of the specific applications I want us to think about this week is I want us to identify someone close to you. Think about this. Who is close to you? It could be a friend. It could be a child a spouse, a fellow church member, a grandchild, whoever it may be. And I want you to bless them 
both generally and specifically in a prayer with them. Communicate to them in that prayer, in that moment, the righteous character of God, what God's promises are in the gospel in Christ Jesus, and bless them with those truths. Asking the Lord to do the blessing, knowing that you are there as an instrument to encourage and establish them in what God is doing. Because whether you bless God's people generally or specifically, your prayer is a blessing. What they're doing is they refuse to affirm to that person or group of people that the status quo of brokenness and sin is all that there is. No, in that moment, what you're doing in the fullness of optimistic faith, you're blessing others with the truth that the Father is restoring and perfecting His creation through His Son by the work of His Holy Spirit in His people. That's what you're doing. And I just want to, i got a couple minutes, so I just want to add something to this and just remind ourselves of what these three men were doing. They, or particularly Jacob and Joseph, they were in the land of strangers. And Isaac as well. He was surrounded by strangers. But in the temporary, in the presence of evil, in the presence of idolatry, their optimistic faith was in the Lord. They weren't looking to Egypt. They weren't looking to the gods of the land. They recognized the fact that this life is temporary. And they carry themselves with holiness and righteousness. And they worship God in their temporary dwellings. You and I are sojourners and strangers in this world. This world is not our home. Even in the Millennium Kingdom, this world is not our home. There is a new heavens and a new earth. We are passing through. May we do so with holiness and righteousness because we're surrounded like Jacob was in Egypt with idols all around. May we be, fa be found faithful from the moment of today to our last breath to be worshiping the God who has redeemed us from evil and has delivered us from our sins. So if you are in Christ, you have every reason to be optimistic. As I've said, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So for the follower of Christ, no matter what tomorrow holds, no matter what 2022 holds, or any year after that, the best is yet to come. So look forward Look forward to the glorious hope that we have in Christ and live out our faith with confident optimism in the face of every trial and blessing others with the truths of the gospel as we go. You're not going to get there through resolutions. The new year does nothing. It's, a new, it's another day. But with man, what is impossible is absolutely possible with God. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for blessing us so richly in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your spirit who indwells us and who unites us with Christ, who unites us with you. Oh, Lord, we long for the day when our faith will be made sight. But until that day, oh Lord, I pray that you would keep our eyes fixed on your word and the hope it testifies of. May you establish us in love. May you comfort us in our affliction. And may you sanctify us completely, assuring our spirits that indeed the best is yet to come. For it is in the name of our mighty King, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, as I've mentioned before,